En unos minutos vamos a dar inicio con la conferencia magistral. Rogamos, por favor, guardar silencio si fueran tan amables. Buenas tardes, tengan todos ustedes. La Facultad de Derecho de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México les da la más cordial bienvenida a la conferencia magistral Desafíos del Derecho Internacional Humanitario y la Acción Humanitaria que impartirá el presidente del Comité Internacional de la Cruz Roja, doctor Peter Maurer. Preside en este evento la doctora María Leova Castañeda Rivas, directora de la Facultad de Derecho. El doctor Fernando Suinaga Cárdenas, presidente de la Cruz Roja Mexicana. Nuestro invitado de honor, el doctor Peter Maurer, presidente del Comité Internacional de la Cruz Roja. a la señora Patricia Danzi, jefa de operaciones para América del CICR. Y al señor Pedro Scherer, jefe de la delegación regional del CICR para México, América Central y Cuba. Asimismo, nos honra con su presencia los directores de seminarios, presidentes de colegios, consejeros técnicos y universitarios, exdirectores de la Facultad de Derecho, profesores de las distintas áreas de conocimiento jurídico y alumnos de la comunidad universitaria. También saludamos a los representantes de las organizaciones de la sociedad civil que nos acompañan y medios de comunicación nacional e internacional. Para iniciar los trabajos, pedimos a la doctora María Leova Castañeda Rivas nos haga el honor de dar el mensaje de bienvenida a nuestro distinguido invitado. Buenas noches a todos y a todas ustedes, distinguido invitado de honor, don Peter Maure, que el día de hoy nos honra verdaderamente su visita, la labor humanitaria que ha realizado, el gran trabajo que su organización internacional, el Comité Internacional de la Cruz Roja, ejecuta, es para nosotros sumamente grato tenerle aquí en compañía de personas que hacen de la labor humanitaria una forma de vida, una forma elemental de generar en los derechos humanos, en las reglas de los derechos humanos, generar una especialidad tan valiosa como es el derecho humanitario y las reglas humanitarias para poder resolver conflictos, para poder ayudar, que es un derecho humano fundamental, a las personas que tienen alguna desgracia, algún problema de salud, alguna contingencia en donde nosotros no podemos olvidar la serie de labores que se han ejecutado en conjunción con la Cruz Roja, tanto la Internacional cuanto la Cruz Roja Nacional, las labores conjuntas que esta Casa de Estudios ha ejecutado en la traducción de libros, en la realización de proyectos y programas que nos dan verdaderamente la cualidad de generar una cultura de ayuda, una cultura en donde se cumple con los compromisos del derecho humanitario, de las reglas fundamentales que se complementan en convenciones, en acuerdos, en tratados, en protocolos, en una serie de reglas y 
acuerdos en donde México es parte y que por supuesto el derecho humanitario es una creación del siglo XX, de finales del siglo XX, pero que por supuesto desde las guerras mundiales hemos tenido una forma de ayuda cuando hay contingencia a nivel nacional, a nivel internacional, a nivel municipal. Entonces para nosotros el día de hoy es muy grato escuchar una conferencia en donde lo que tenemos como perspectiva es el derecho humanitario. Además de esta gran oportunidad que tenemos el día de hoy de recibir a un personaje del nivel del señor don Peter Maurer, para nosotros es muy importante que la comunidad estudiantil, la comunidad de los profesores, seminarios, los funcionarios de esta facultad, estemos todos unidos reunidos aquí para escuchar esta interesante plática, al mismo tiempo que le doy un afectuoso saludo de nuestro señor rector, quien por cuestiones de trabajo, el doctor José Narro Robles, no ha podido estar aquí con nosotros, pero pues así son las agendas tan exigentes de nuestra rectoría, y lo importante es que está bien representado con una comunidad que siempre se destaca por tener la calidad de los alumnos, de los trabajadores, de nuestros catedráticos, directores de seminario, integrantes del consejo técnico, exdirectores que también nos acompañan, maestros eméritos, es decir, estamos en una, en una cuestión importantísima donde se amalgama la cultura jurídica para venir a abrevar del conocimiento de una persona que ha hecho del derecho humanitario, de los derechos humanos, una cultura permanente. Qué bueno que también tenemos aquí al presidente de la Cruz Roja Nacional, Fernando, es un gusto tenerlo aquí con nosotros. Por ahí también debe andar Fabián Mondragón, que forma parte de ese comité, y pues nos da muchísimo gusto que hoy esta facultad está verdaderamente con invitados de lujo, como dicen nuestras mamás, de manteles largos, porque tenemos la oportunidad de escuchar una conferencia de primer nivel. Gracias a todos, queridos amigos, distinguidas personalidades, a los acompañantes de nuestro invitado de honor, todos sean ustedes bienvenidos, y pues no me queda más que ceder la palabra, y ya sin más preámbulos, esperar esta gran conferencia para la que estamos verdaderamente preparados. El doctor Peter Maurer es originario de la ciudad de Thun, Suiza, y realizó estudios de Historia y Derecho Internacional en Berna, donde obtuvo su doctorado. En el año de 1996, fue designado observador permanente de la misión suiza ante la Organización de las Naciones Unidas y en 2000 embajador y jefe de la división encargada de la seguridad humana en el Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores de su país. En 2004 es nombrado embajador de Suiza ante la ONU, siendo electo presidente de la quinta comisión responsable de los asuntos administrativos y presupuestarios de ese organismo internacional, donde además presidió la Comisión para la Consolidación de la Paz y Configuración del Estado de Burundi. Fue Secretario de Asuntos Exteriores de Suiza y desde el 1 de julio de 2012 preside uno de los organismos internacionales más importantes de ayuda humanitaria a nivel mundial, el Comité Internacional de la Cruz Roja, y a quien pedimos nos haga el honor de hacer uso de la palabra. Listo, con Maurer. Fernando Suinay Academias, uh, muy distinguidos maestros y estudiantes, señores representantes de las organizaciones de la sociedad civil y autoridades que nos acompañan 
representantes de los medios de comunicación, estimados colegas y amigos. Agradezco la oportunidad de dirigirme a ustedes a UNAM, una de las universidades más prestigiosas de América Latina, dedicada a la justicia social, a los ideales humanitarios, en una facultad de derecho que forma a los dirigentes mexicanos del futuro. This is as far as my Spanish uh, reads. <laughs> so, with your indulgence, I will uh, turn to English, but I know that it is translation, and uh, I'm also happy at the end of this conference, of course, uh, with my colleagues to respond uh, to your questions. Since the establishment uh, in 2002 of the delegation in Mexico City of the ICRC, the organization, my organization, has enjoyed a steadily deepening dialogue with Mexico at many levels, including the government, the academic community, civil society, and in particular, the Mexican Red Cross Society. That dialogue has allowed the development of relationships of trust, which has made it possible for the ICRC to adapt its activities. Since the establishment in 2002, sorry, that to, to, adapt the, to adapt the activities. The dialogue has uh, initially our activities were oriented towards the promotion of international humanitarian law, regularly relying on Mexico's leadership in many international fora, addressing international humanitarian law related issues, be it at the United Nations, the Organization of American States, and the International Conference of Red Cross and Red Crescent. The ICRC's activities have gradually evolved and moved towards trying to address humanitarian needs of people affected by changing patterns of armed violence in the last few years. This represents an evolution in our action that would not have been possible without the close cooperation with the Mexican Red Cross Society with whom we carry out a considerable part of our activities. Tonight, I would like to give you a brief overview of how the ICRC sees war and violence in a changing world globally, in Latin America and in Mexico, and how we as humanitarians are trying to access people in need to deliver essential aid to create a humanitarian space amidst conflict and violence Speaking at the law school, as uh, the rector said, I will focus on some of the critical ways to assist and protect people through law, through international humanitarian law. Across the world, the number of wars is decreasing. That should be good news. In, in reality, only the number of all out, out international armed conflicts are decreasing. Internal armed conflicts and lengthy violent situations are increasing. We see a new type of conflict and violence emerging with new dynamics to create new challenges for humanitarian actors. What do we see? We see protracted conflicts that are ever longer in duration and affect basic social systems. For example, in Afghanistan, in Somalia, in Israel, and the occupied Palestinian territories. We see the challenge to respond with short-term humanitarian measures to long-term problems that those protracted conflicts are creating. We also see regionalized conflicts increasingly that spill over into neighboring countries, like the violence in northern Nigeria that is affecting Niger, Chad, and other countries in the region, or the Syrian conflict, which affects Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq, uh, and, and Jordan. We see volatile conflicts spiked with terrorist tactics and spread through the ideological battlegrounds that is social media. For instance, in Iraq, with the emergence, uh, and in Syria, with the emergence of Islamic State group. The challenge is, therefore, for an organization like mine to increasingly be flexible and agile in order to respond to those volatile conflicts which change patterns from one day to another. 
We are increasingly confronted with politicized and increasingly polarized conflicts with few perspectives for political settlements as we see in Ukraine or in Yemen as we speak. <coughs> Battlefields that extend to cities and civilian communities with bombing and attacks in densely populated areas like in Syria or Gaza are increasingly patterns of violence which are familiar to us. We need, therefore, to address the specifics of assisting and protecting people in densely populated areas. We see violence imposed by new actors, which mix political and criminal and business interests into amorphous structures. For example, in Central America, or right here in Mexico. <coughs> the challenges of armed conflict and other violent situations is it to have an adequate legal framework to deal with those issues and to have practical responses to those new challenges. For the past 150 years, the Geneva Conventions and other bodies of international law have codified the limits of war. We have defined spaces of humanitarian action and the law has codified the limit of that space. These limits of war are not only to be found in international humanitarian law. They are universal human norms which have existed for a thousand years based on the intrinsic value of humanity, dignity, protection of vulnerable and the service to those in need. Yet, there is a range of issues that considerable complicates the respect of law today. Let me just mention a couple of those issues. A first issue is the one of compliance with the existing treaty and customary law, in particular humanitarian law, something that is at the core of the ICRC's activities related to the protection of persons in armed conflict. The ICRC works to improve compliance with international humanitarian law by being present on the ground, by maintaining bilateral confidential dialogue with states and non-state actors to address specific humanitarian problems. In parallel, the ICRC also works to enhance compliance with IHL through activities designed at fostering understanding and acceptance of international humanitarian law, as well as assisting authorities in the implementation of the law in domestic legal frameworks. <coughs> Such efforts also include reaching out to influential circles, including religious and community leaders and scholars, which enable us to better understand how value systems relate to the law of war and to identify communalities with international humanitarian law. We have worked over the last 10 years with religious leaders in the Islamic world to find the adequacy of what is in the Geneva Conventions expressed as international humanitarian law and Islam. And we are engaging each and every day with religious leaders in those areas in order to ensure that what the core values of international humanitarian law is are translated in the language and normative systems of Islam. And we have done this also in other cultural contexts in which we are active. But we have to recognize that the compliance of international law is heavily dependent on the political will of the parties of conflict. The Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols uh, provide for a whole series of mechanisms to strengthen compliance, but they have rarely, if ever, been used. The reason for their failure is that their functioning is subject to the consent of parties concerned. They were designed for international armed conflicts, not non-international ones. Similar challenges overshadow mechanisms established under the UN. They too are subject to political negotiation and selective in their choice of which situation to address. For all these reasons, the ICRC in Switzerland have launched a, a, a consultation process with states to identify options for a strengthening compliance mechanism. It is my firm belief that we have to create a platform, a regular thematic exchange of 
intergovernmental debate in order to keep and revive the interests of states of the high contracting parties in the interest of international humanitarian law, to encourage commitment to respect the law, and also to encourage peer pressure and ensure professional dialogue. For this, we need a new framework and a new platform to discuss regularly international humanitarian law in order to see this law implemented more seriously. Another issue today complicating the respect of the law is related to the deprivation of liberty of persons. In international armed conflicts, the law clearly states when and why a person can be detained or interned. Things get more complicated uh, in situations of non-international armed conflicts where IHL is far less precise and elaborate and it is also exactly in this context in non-international armed conflicts that tens of thousands of people are detained today without proper legal framework. The reason for this lack of certainty and the lack of clarity is that IHL applicable in non-international armed conflict fails to clarify the permissible grounds of detention and require procedural safeguards which leaves detaining authorities without predetermined rules to rely on against arbitrary detention. The conflict patterns evolve faster than the law and we find ourselves with a legal gap where increasingly people are detained without proper legal frameworks on how long and what the applicable rules are. With all the uncertainties on applicable legal frameworks, international humanitarian law and human rights law partially overlap in situations of non-international armed conflict where the clarity of the law is met with a much more complex, multi-layered reality on the ground. Likewise, issues such as the transfer of detainees from one state to another, and you are well, very much aware that in the context of the fight against terrorism, detainees are increasingly transferred, uh, detained in one place and transferred uh, to other countries. So the rules of transfer, the material conditions of detention, including food, shelter, and medical care to which prisoners are, uh, are entitled, all these are uh, happening in legal vacuum and need to be addressed uh, today. This is the reason why, again, uh, in the past uh, International Red, uh, Red Cross and Red Crescent Conference, ICRC got the mandate to explore, together with the high contracting parties, possibilities to fill this legal, this legal gap. The ICRC works together with states to address these issues and to find practical and legal solutions. Let me mention a third area of problems for application for the application of international humanitarian law today, and it relates to weapons and warfare. While the main challenge for improving the situation of victims of armed conflict is to ensuring respecting for existing norms, one cannot ignore the evolu evolving ways the wars have been fought in the 21st century in particular. The rapid evolution of military capability is a case in point. The Geneva Conventions give the ICRC a mandate to work on, human, on the humanitarian impact of weapons, always following the rule that all warfare must respect principles of precaution, proportionality, and distinction. We see it as a success that we managed, together with interested states, to enforce a ban on anti-personnel mines or massively regulate the trade of small weapons through the arms trade treaties. Small arms and light weapons, after all, and mines are conventional weapons which, to a large extent, are responsible for most of the injuries and death in today's country. So we are currently working on the issue of the explosive, of, of explosive and the use of explosives in densely populated areas. While the battlefields have moved into cities, we cannot accept that the weapons move along into urban centers, too close to family homes, hospitals, and schools. It is therefore critical 
that we find a new way of behavior of the use of weapons in densely populated areas. At the same time, new methods and means of warfare, such as cyber warfare and autonomous weapons, have become subject of increasing debate in the humanitarian, legal, and diplomatic community. Clearly, the drafters of the Geneva Conventions did not foresee such technology when the conventions were, were drafted. So be it in, with regard to weapons and warfare, be it with regard to implementation in general of the existing law, be it with regard to the treatment of detainees, all these examples show what some of the critical challenges are to implement the law, to fill the gap today, and to respond to the pressing challenges that present day conflicts offer to an organization which is active in the humanitarian field and tries to, to respond to assistance and protection to the needs emerging in conflict. At the ICRC, we base our actions on the limits of war, as I have mentioned. Not because the Geneva Conventions allow us to do so, but because where the limits of war are not respected, men, women, and children who have not taken up arms or combatants who have laid out their arms are deprived of, of the protection from murder, rape, pillage, humiliation, and the list goes on. We base our actions on the needs of people affected by conflict and violence wherever this leads to humanitarian consequences. Our experience shows that mutual Impartial and independent humanitarian action has the best chance to reach those most in need. It, also, it is also a tried and tested formula to prevent humanitarian action so that it is becoming part of a larger and more controversial political agenda. Yet, the humanitarian space necessary for our work for mutual, impartial and independent humanitarianism is becoming increasingly difficult to navigate against the new type of conflict and actors that are dominating today globally and in this region of the world as well. In Latin America, a continent not unfamiliar with armed violence, the last two decades have seen the emergence of new forms of armed violence that are generating alarming levels of humanitarian consequences for the populations of many, if not most, of the countries of this continent. Much of the violence today no longer stems predominantly from political confrontations, but stems to be driven more and more by motives related to other gains, including through illegal activities such as drug, tra drug trafficking. Despite such trends, the humanitarian consequences identified are often similar to those experienced in context of more traditional patterns of violence such as armed conflict or internal disturbances. Such consequences include people being killed, wounded, or going missing. But there are also consequences directly generated by general insecurity. For example, when people are prevented from accessing basic services, such as health care and schooling, because it is too dangerous to go out into the streets. Or when they feel compelled to move from their homes to other places either within their country or abroad, due to the lack of social and economic opportunities or for fear that something might happen to them or their families. It is clear that this type of scenario poses a series of challenges for authorities and humanitarian actors alike. The perpetrators of such violence are not always accessible, nor possible to control and are not necessarily concerned about the well-being of populations. In the same way, communities or individuals who live under constant fear of threat of violence are not always forthcoming in reporting problems, much less so those who find themselves in another country without the correct documentation. Even when a clear desire to improve the situation is expressed, the resources available are often not enough, leaving gaps in services or proce procedures designed to protect the most vulnerable and exposed. The ICRC 
aims to provide a meaningful response to the humanitarian needs of people in the region and as such has adapted its approach in several contexts in Latin America and the Caribbean, including in Mexico, where the ICRC remains very concerned about the humanitarian situation in several parts of the country where people are affected by high levels of violence but do not receive the help and assistance they need. Unlike other organizations, the ICRC does not focus only on one specific area, like health or food, nor on one specific group, like children or women, nor on one specific type of activity, like assistance or advocacy. We are committed to respond to a broad area of needs, food, water, sanitation, health, basic household items, and thus describe ourselves as a multidisciplinary organization, an organization which tries to calibre the response according to the needs as they emerge in a specific context. We focus on the most urgent needs of people and thus on a broad range of vulnerabilities. We are radically needs-based in our approach and thus work in direct proximity of victims. We are not just a relief agency, but committed to assist and to protect, to influence weapons bearers, to respect contractual and customary frameworks in the limitation of the use of weapons, and we try to influence actors on the ground to better protect civilians, and we make use of the law, of international humanitarian law and customary law in order to do all this. With such an approach, our response is distinct and different throughout countries and regions. We have a very different exposure today in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia, or in Latin America. I would like to give you an overview of how we try to respond to some of those needs in Mexico, particularly uh, to migration, missing persons, health care, and the use of force by law enforcement officials. The ICRC is deeply concerned by the situation of migrants in the region. Vulnerable as they are to the effects of armed conflict or of other situations of violence. Amongst these groups, women, children are particularly exposed to the multiple forms of violence and exploitations that exist. In Mexico, in partnership with the Mexican Red Cross Society, the ICRC has looked for ways to respond to the specific needs of populations. Following the Me Mexican Red Cross example in Sonora, Red Cross points have been set up along the migratory route, providing basic assistance to migrants in transit to attend the immediate needs. Tools have been developed to help migrants protect themselves from potential hazards during the long and dangerous journey, and assistance is also provided to those deported back to Mexico. In addition, several migrant shelters run by Mexican non-governmental organizations have received assistance, either through improving access to drinking water or by rehabilitating infrastructure in order to ensure that migrants were accommodated in dignified conditions. Migrants with severe injuries Amputated limbs have also received assistance from the Mexican Red Cross and for pieces or toes and other devices as, as, as institutions supported by the ICRC. This is a good example how we learn from traditional armed conflict in other regions of the world and in other times and how we capitalize in order to help find a humanitarian response to a humanitarian problem in another part of the world. One consequence of migration, be it in the search or more of, be it in the search or more opportunities, or to attempt to flee present or imminent danger, is the loss of contact with loved ones. This, is, this can result in the person being considered missing by his or her family and causes high levels of anguish and suffering for those without news. Part of our response has been aimed at developing to restore family links, which is one more of the lines of action in which our partnership with the Red Cross movement in the region has proven so successful. Sometimes all it takes is a phone call. 
So we provide photos. Several thousands of migrants have been able to contact their loved ones thanks to ICRC-funded telephone services, either at Mexican Red Cross, ICRC assistance points, or shelters. In addition, calling card dispensers have been installed in various shelters along the migratory route. The ICRC enjoys an ongoing and constructive dialogue with the authorities on ensuring that migrants in Mexican retention centers have adequate living conditions, including access to health care and contact with families. In addition, the ICRC seeks to remind the authorities of their obligation towards migrants in terms of protection needs and respect for their fundamental rights. The respect of the law is not an abstract construct. The respect of the law translates in concrete action or the law remains abstract. It is necessary to ensure that the framework of protection for the migrant population established at national level is applied and respected, as well as to ensure that the required resources are available. Here again, uh, what needs uh, is not only commitments to respect the law, but prioritization and resources in order to make the law respected. Let me give another example with regard to the missing persons and their families. Throughout the region, there are thousands of families who are without any news regarding the whereabouts of a relative who may have disappeared or on his or her journey as a migrant, but also in other circumstances not involving migration. Of these, a vast number go missing in Mexico for various reasons. But there is no single mechanism for the search of missing persons, nor identify mortal remains. This prevents most families, either in Mexico or in, region, in the region, from ever knowing the fate of their loved ones and serves to prolong the suffering for all those who have a right to an answer. The ICRC has been working to respond to the plight of missing persons and their families in for a long time the world over, in particular where disappearances were related to armed conflicts and other situations of violence. Here again, this is not a new phenomenon. We have worked throughout the, the centuries and the decades on the issue of reuniting family, of missing persons, of finding the missing, but we transport our knowledge from other places and other contexts into the specifics of uh, the Mexican situation and the Latin American situation today. In Mexico, such efforts include work with the authorities on the measures that effectively respond to the complex needs of the families of persons gone missing. First and foremost, they need to know what has happened to their missing loved one. The ICRC is providing legal and technical expertise to the authorities, for example, on protocols to improve the quality of standardized data collection of missing persons, the handling of human remains, or for strengthening the support to families. In addition, the ICRC is developing a dialogue and cooperation with members of the civil society who work on this issue and have a wealth of experience in order to ensure that the voice of the families is also heard and taken into account in terms of political policies and the eventual creation, uh, creation of mechanism to properly address the problem. For progress to be made on this issue, it is essential that all those involved, including civil society and the families themselves, work together to decide jointly which steps need to be taken. The ICRC reiterates its continued commitment to providing any technical or other support that it is required. In several parts of the country, it has become difficult for people to receive adequate health care and for health services to carry out their, their mission. The ICRC has intensified efforts to share through training events direct, directed at health professionals its experience in treating weapon wounded, providing free hospital care, and ensuring ambulance services in risky situations. An important part of such activities have also focused on the approaches and practices strengthening the protection of health workers and facilities, as well as of patients during emergencies, 
Such efforts include incorporating these subjects into teaching curricula of medical institutions. Evolving forms of violence have required law enforcement authorities in this country and beyond to adapt their operating procedures and equipment. In many countries, this has entailed an increasing involvement of the military assisting civilian authorities in the accomplishment of the law enforcement activities, including in Mexico. Whether civilian or military forces are being deployed to ensure public order, it is critical for the respect of the law and the protection of persons that they have the means to do so in conformity with international human rights law and applicable international recognized standards. Such means include adequate legal frameworks as well as doctrines, operating procedures, integrating the applicable international rules and standards in order to ensure that operations evolving the use of force under law enforcement paradigm can be properly planned and carried out, the forces dispose of adequate equipment and are appropriately trained for their mission. The ICRC has been cooperating with police and armed forces in Mexico in their effort to integrating international human rights law and standards into doctrines, procedures, and training. In some states of Mexico, efforts to help communities cope with violence has involved promoting discussions among secondary school students and their teachers on humanitarian values to contribute, fomenting respect for human life and dignity in their communities. Such projects have been implemented together with the Mexican Red Cross Society and local education departments, namely in Guerrero and Chihuahua. The ICRC continues to increase and review its efforts, together with the Mexican Red Cross Society, to mitigate the consequences of violence, be it through our action in favor of migrants or of missing persons and their families, be it through the strengthening access to health services, be it when trying to ensure that international human, human rights law and standards are adequately integrated into doctrines and procedures on the use of force under law enforcement paradigm, or be it when working with communities on humanitarian values. We are convinced that those efforts to bring a measure of humanity that make a difference to those affected by armed violence, and we are determined to continue to make the difference a difference slowly, steadily, but with perseverance and determination. Beyond our work on legal frameworks and our cooperation on the ground, we engage in advocacy too. Creating awareness and spreading information about some lesser known sides of the humanitarian consequences of armed conflicts can help prevent suffering. Sexual violence, for example, against women, men, boys, girls, and detainees has been part of wars for centuries all over the world. But it is a war crime. We aim to educate and inform the military, other weapons carriers, and communities about this risk, the suffering and the essential medical and psychosocial treatment for victims of sexual violence. Two years ago, we launched a campaign on the matter of protecting healthcare facilities and staff. Because what happens when, health, when hospitals are attacked or doctors and nurses targeted? When medical aid is blocked from delivery, people suffer longer and more. Just last week in Yemen, a plane carrying medical equipment was prevent prevented from landing. This means hospitals cannot treat patients, and wounded people were quickly filling up the hospitals, but the medicine hasn't arrived. The same week, a colleague of mine was shot while driving an ICRC truck to get more medicine for a hospital in northern Mali. The security of our staff has to be a priority. So how can we work when we are being attacked for doing our work? At the ICRC, we believe in making every effort to marry practical experience, policy, and law. This way, we can counter the fatal spiral of violence and disrespect for the law with strong encouragement 
for practical humanitarianism supported by strong law and decisive political action. I thank you very much and I look very much more forward to your question than to my uh, conversation here. Thanks a lot. Regarding missing persons in Mexico, uh, may I ask, we do know that the national, uh, that, the, uh, that the Attorney General's office has already started implementing the act of mortem, mortem and post-mortem questionnaires. But we have also documented that many of these interviews that are supposed to be made by professional personnel to the families of the victims have been actually been carried out in a self-administered way, what this I mean, the, the, most of the times what happens is that victims receive the post-mortem uh, or, or the anti-mortem questionnaires to be taken home, and they are supposed to be filling them out at their homes. We have document, documentation of all this, and I'm wondering if the Red Cross is following suit with this technical advice that they're giving, because it's one thing to deliver the goods and another thing to supervise that they're carried out in a proper manner. Hola, buenas noches. Eh, una pregunta. Hubo una parte en su, en su ponencia en donde usted habla sobre los eh, conflictos armados amorfos o nuevos conflictos armados, ¿no? Y hace referencia al caso de México. Entonces, digamos, en un, en, un, en un escenario en el de México en donde los grupos armados están más destinados a, a hacer cuestiones como vender drogas, ¿no? Específicamente, ¿cómo sería o cómo algún método, si hay algún método, alguna herramienta que pueda utilizar el Comité Internacional de la Cruz Roja para hacer que grupos armados organizados que son amorfos, que tienen una, una combinación de propósitos, puedan cumplir el derecho internacional humanitario, porque al final del día me parece que ese es el gran desafío del derecho internacional humanitario, ¿no? Hacer que los grupos armados organizados cumplan con este derecho. recommend and supervise the, the increasing number of security agreements between the U.S. and the regions in America, in America such as Plan Colombia, Plan Merida, and the Central American uh, Regional Security Initiative that has had devastating consequences on civil society and, the, and our detained population. And, and what we are, and also ask what we are doing and what the ICRC is doing to change the rhetoric that um, it is not it is not the drug trafficking that is killing our populations and our communities, but rather rather the drug, the war on drugs. Thank you. 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 Thank
thank you very much. Uh, not all of them easy questions. Uh, <laughs> let, let me start with uh, the question of autonomous weapons. Uh, I, I don't have the response yet on what the best way is to deal uh, in, in legal terms with those weapons because those weapons are in a process of being developed as we speak and have high-speed technological developments which make it very difficult to, to see how we frame it. Uh, the issue of international humanitarian law with autonomous weapons. What I can tell you is the following. The basis of international humanitarian law and of all law is basically that there are responsible individuals uh, at the end of the day which carry responsibility within a legal framework. The problem with autonomous uh, weapons is to find whether this is a degree of technology which where still an individual decides. In that case, basically, international humanitarian law, if the individual decides and maneuvers the weapon, is applicable. Problems start when technological development may go into a situation where there is no more a responsible individual responsible for the firing of the weapon and for the targeting and that, that, that therefore the adequacy of the law in terms of distinction, proportionality and precaution cannot be logically derived uh, to the military operations. So, to be very frank, we don't know how best to deal with those issues. What we do at the present moment is engage with those countries who have and start to have capacities on autonomous weapons and to find out in which direction the weapons developments are going and to draw their attention to the problem in the development but I don't have any satisfactory reply to this uh, uh, issue which is very much directed to possible future warfare uh, uh, and not to the present warfare. And you heard me say loud and clearly, let's not forget that those weapons which kill today are very traditional weapons. So most of the victims and therefore our focus in developing the law has been with the mine ban treaty, with the arms trade treaty, with convention, limiting the use of conventional weapons with densely populated areas. With regard to antemortem, postmortem data collections and procedures, let me just say the following. This is an issue where ICRC, because of its involvement in so many conflicts worldwide during so much time. 150 years of experience in almost all armed conflicts, international, non-international, and in many situations of violence. We have developed standards, technology, and know-how. And we are ready to share and to be advised on those standards, technologies, and know-how. And this had happened in the case of Mexico. We have some of our information technology has met, been made available. But we are not a judicial authority which has an ability to supervise. We can advise. But then sovereign authorities have to put the mechanisms in place to follow the protocols, to change the legislation, to have the practice in place which allows the necessary protocols to be deployed properly. So we are here to accompany the process, to help wherever help is needed, to share our experience, to make our experience available. Uh, but uh, of course we, we cannot be in charge, but we can only support. Uh, this process. I'll give you the floor at the end and I'll go uh, continue uh, with uh, uh, 
with the question. The engagement of an organization like ICRC with amorphous uh, non-state actors in contexts of violence is one of the most complicated issues with which we are dealing. Let me just broadly make two distinctions. We do have levels of violence, in particular in the Middle East, which uh, are inter clearly internal armed conflict, and therefore Article 1 of the Geneva Convention is applicable to those armed groups, which means that there are rules of behaviors uh, in Article 1 and 3 of the Geneva Conventions which prescribe and give a legal framework of engagement with those non-state armed groups. And so what we do normally in those contexts is that we try to reach those groups, that we try to train them, that we try to engage them in the discussion if we realize that flagrant violations of international humanitarian law has happened. So at the present moment, we, we do training of armed groups uh, in the Middle East, not, not of all of them, but those we reach, and we train them in the conduct of hostilities, in the respect of detainees, and the basic humane treatment of detainees. But here again, I have to be honest, this does not mean that those armed groups afterwards do respect the law. It means that we engage with them in a very long-term and difficult process. It is, of course, even more complicated when ICRC has not a mandate. Uh, when the, when the, we are confronted with patterns of violence which are not adequate uh, adequating uh, the situations of armed conflict. And here we don't have a mandate. We eventually have to see whether in a context there is any political appetite or consensus uh, to do similar work with these types of armed groups. But here again, we are in a very different, uh, in a very different <coughs> ball game. And, and again, the success of those enterprises is never guaranteed. What I can tell you from past experience, just to give you an example, I mean, we do have engaged for now more than 15 years with the Taliban in Afghanistan. And we have run numerous training programs. We have visited detainees that the Taliban have made in the conduct of the in the context of the violence. And we do see that certain things change. But the, but the time period is enormous and the guarantees are not, are not given. This is the honest answer. Methodologically, we do not escape uh, to engaging with those groups and trying to convince them that what they are doing are eventually serious violations of international law and may lead uh, to accountability procedures uh, in certain periods, not through ICRC, but through other bodies of the international community. With regard to uh, security uh, agreements, uh, ICRC as a humanitarian organization tries to engage with all those who have an impact and an influence in a specific theater of conflict. So the whole philosophy of the first articles of the Geneva Conventions is that if there is a certain level of violence and therefore of armed conflict, we engage with all sides in order to draw their attention to the potential violation, but also to their obligations. And it is one of our continual dialogues with countries all over the world who are engaged in those operations to assess what the first article of the Geneva Convention means and what the significance of 
respect and they truly respect what international law means. Traditionally, there was an interpretation, as some of the law students here may know, that this is only limited to your own behavior inside your borders. But I think we have to take a more generous interpretation, and our reading is that more important obligations come with the Geneva Conventions, and when you transfer <coughs> weapons, you are also responsible that those weapons are used in a way compatible with international humanitarian law. So the whole debate today is, what is the border, what are the limits? And this is not an issue which is <coughs> explicitly defined in any legal text. It's an, it's an issue for which we have to raise conscience with high contracting parties and other parties to conflict, and for which the ICRC is here to engage and to work on specific cases and to try to change behavior when we look at the humanitarian impact that certain weapons and certain use of weapons have. So we do not criticize or engage on overall plans. We engage on the use and the humanitarian impact because this is what our watching the images right behind you, which were really cool, which were the ones you were with a vest with some other people, yeah. are walking around the ruins of some city. So are you not very old to pursue a career in the humanitarian law or to help some, some to, to help the ICR? But is it that dangerous? I mean, like, if I wanted to join uh, the work you are performing, would, that, would I be signing my, my, uh, I mean, like, would I die, like, very soon? I mean, I don't want to be, I mean, it's not like, I don't want to be nasty. I mean, it's not a funny question, because sure. when, when I knew you were coming here, I had always been interested in what you do, but really, really interested. But then when I was seeing the pictures over there, I said, like, Jesus Christ, I'm going to be like, what, for a week? And then what's going to happen? Yeah, because one thing is to work at a desk, at a courthouse, and another very different thing is to be on site. Je voulais demander en français, mais je vais faire en anglais. Une main de la compagnie du milieu ou le compagnon du milieu, levantant la main. Si, pas pour rien, pas mal. Comment ça va? Nous sommes Hi, Mr. Wicker. Welcome to our call. My name is Enrique Vera, and I would love to know what opportunities are in the team can law students have to work. I don't mind the, the risky situation. Thank you. Hi, I'm an art media. I have read so much about you. Uh, my job is about collateral, collateral damage. I've been reading a lot, and I would like to know which is the position of the CIA. 
like the ones that you saw for the interviews. But uh, I think when you work in a humanitarian organization, and this is maybe also uh, a response to the second question, you accept at the basis that this is a dangerous context. So you get used to worrying. And it is a dangerous context because you are working in armed conflict and situations of violence. That's the very point of your mandate that you are there. So the point of your mandate is not that you are in a courthouse. Uh, the point is that you are there. And and our philosophy is that you worry least when you are closest to the conflict and you try to understand the dynamics on the ground and you try to engage with the victims and you try to talk to the perpetrators and you try to use the law, as I said, in order to have practical advances. You don't use the law because it's the law. You use the law because you want to achieve something. You want to be able to access people. You want to deliver something. You want to be able to go into prison and visit detainees. So you try to find a legal argument around your operations. And if you like that, uh, be a candidate when uh, we open uh, posts, and you, if you don't like it, and you find it slightly too insecure, uh, you can do something else. Huh? Uh, there are more and less dangerous uh, places in the world. I want, I wanted, nevertheless, to impress also because I had also the question: How can you become? Uh, delegates of ICRC, we are recruiting worldwide, uh, we are recruiting delegates each and every year, a couple of hundred. We have worldwide, last year we had 500 openings as delegates, we had seven or eight, 17 or 18,000 applications. So people do like to come to work at ICRC probably for two reasons, because it's a noble mandate, it's, you know at the end of the day what you have done, most of the time. Uh, yeah, maybe not always, let's not exa exaggerate. <laughs> Don't want you to be disappointed after. But most of the time, you, you have an advantage of having a clear mandate. And, and this is a, something which is very motivating. And you have the assurances that you have an organization who cares about the people it employs. ICRC, to be very frank, has a much better security record than most other humanitarian organizations. And why do we have that? Because first we work with our national partners. They know the context. They know the politics of the place. I think over the years and decades, have developed practices of safer access which allows us to improve our security. We have discussed this uh, with our Mexican colleagues and implemented in terms of training and engagement with colleagues. So it looks dangerous, very dangerous from the image. I don't want to minimize the danger, but we do a lot to mitigate and we offer a lot in terms of satisfaction uh, of the kind of job you are being able to do uh, when you work for ICRC. Uh, well, your question is a tricky one with regard to, as, as everybody knows probably here, as we are at the law faculty, the fundamental difference between humanitarian law and human rights law is that in humanitarian law, or the basis of humanitarian law, is the ponderation between military necessity and the protection of civilians. It's not a law which is, in that sense, clearly prescriptive 
on how this ponderation looks like and what is a reasonable ponderation and what is not. What we are doing is, and this is the reason why we are so keen to engage with the armed forces and with armed groups worldwide, is really to engage and to do operational review with the armed forces and to see, look, given the result, where is your military necessity? And where does, how does it compare to 2,000 dead civilians? Uh, I think we, we try to have a contextual debate with the military and always to engage them into a discussion. We also try to engage with the military and to share with them the best practices. There are good practices on how far you put your military camp away from a school or a church or a village. You don't need to have rocket science, but I mean, 200 meters is too close. Uh, if you go sufficiently far away, you know that you are respecting the principle of uh, of distinguishing between the civilian installation and the military. So we don't have always the clear indication. Every situation is context related. We work, for instance, a lot with militaries in situations of combat in which we try to influence instructions that are given. And where we look at procedures that countries have, who decides and what are the precautionary filters that are used till a decision is taken to bomb this or that village or this or that installation. The most famous one, of course, is, uh, because it has been widely publicized, is our engagement with, uh, with the Israeli army on warfare in Gaza. Uh, because it is an exemplary uh, example of how we engage profoundly with an armed force and what kind of arguments the armed force would use afterwards in the discussion. When we would say this is beyond proportionality and precaution, they would say, for instance, but the Palestinians went uh, armed into that hospital and therefore the hospital became a military object. So we try to find practical solutions. What is a reasonable warning? We have seen that armies have complied and have followed some of the recommendations we have made. They have warned civilian populations, which was a huge life-saving enterprise. I have said it in other places and publicly, when we have been criticized last summer for not preventing 2,000 dead in Gaza, I, I said to, to, to some of the press, uh, people of the press, ICRC was able to its, through its warnings to make Israel reconsider many of their combat operation and eventually abort. So, but these are dead which were alive after, which were not dead. So these were operations aborted and so small successes. So the, there is no mathematics of proportionality, precaution and distinction. There is only the engagement, concrete context and trying to convince the military to put the proper procedures in place which allows them to comply uh, to those Maybe finally, with regards to engagement with universities, I think, uh, I mean, I'm here, so uh, <laughs> I, we do a lot of engagement with university, a lot of talkings, a lot of, uh, uh, of discussions. My sense is the, the most profitable mutual exchange with universities is really to work on concrete cases where we bring in what we would like to know 
and what our experience is, and students and professors bring in the doctrine and the law. And I think uh, seminars and labs and, and common educational processes are something which we find enormously fruitful. I mean, public debates are interesting because it allows you to explain to a larger public, but I think it is important always to, to find the connex between the practical experience and the doctrinal aspect of law and law development. And there is, I think both of us can learn in that. I think the ICRC, through the pressure of problems as they unfold day to day, we are confronted sometimes with too little systematic and rigorous legal approaches. And at the university, your task is to be rigorous and conceptual. So I think uh, the forms and formats of common research, applied research, common working sessions, try to match the doctrine and the practice are some of the most profitable ways in which we can advance together. Did I respond to most of the questions? <laughs> Gracias.